Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Brett Allen Smith here with IOTV's Morning Briefing. For a while now, there's been growing talk of a possible Hamas-Israel ceasefire. Hamas officials have been in and out of Cairo for the last month, following weeks of some of the worst violence between Israel and the Palestinians in years. While it appears as though those talks may be hitting a dead end, Israel's defense minister now says that the Erez border crossing checkpoints with Gaza will open due to a significant fall in violence from the Strip. The Erez checkpoint is the only place where pedestrians may either enter or leave the Gaza Strip on the Israel side. Israeli officials shuttered Erez roughly a week ago, following a spike in violence from Hamas factions in the Strip. Though Israel does still see daily attacks, namely from explosives laced kites and balloons flown over the border, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman now notes the quote, security calm that was held over the past week and the significantly reduced number of violent incidents, end quote. Meanwhile, however, rumors of a potential year-long ceasefire deal with Hamas seem to be fizzling out. Hamas officials seem to be hesitating on internal Palestinian strategy moving forward, as those talks in Cairo with the Egyptian moderators have been postponed for unspecified reasons. But one possible the possible reason for this potential backpedaling could be the Trump administration's latest decision to slash a further $200 million in Palestinian aid money. While U.S. strategy here seems to be the eventual defunding and the unraveling of UNRWA, the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency, Israeli defense officials have actually come to another conclusion. Those officials are now concerned that the massive budget cuts will actually force Palestinians into a desperate situation, setting off a domino effect of power vacuums, thus giving Hamas an opportunity to seize further control. If Hamas sees an opportunity on the horizon to become even stronger, that would explain why they're now hesitating on maybe signing a ceasefire deal with Israel. Needless to say, much remains to be seen, and much remains mired in speculation. Two months ago, Israel's attorney general indicted the wife of the prime minister on charges concerning the misuse of state funds for personal payments. Sarah Netanyahu has been charged with fraud and breach of trust, and has consistently claimed that she did nothing wrong. She may have to defend that position now in court. The attorney general has just reportedly rejected a plea deal from Netanyahu's lawyers to settle the case. Word is that the Netanyahu team was willing to reimburse nearly all $100,000 of taxpayer money that the defendant is accused of misusing if it meant settling the case and avoiding potential jail time. But Attorney General Mendel Blit is said to have rejected that offer, demanding that the case could only be settled if the Prime Minister's wife admitted to at least partial guilt on this. Now, this is typically why such deals are called guilty pleas and come with leniency from the courts. But Sarah Netanyahu's refusal to do so, even at the cost of what many predict could be a very messy and publicly damaging trial, has been the apparent status quo since these allegations first surfaced. The Prime Minister's wife stands accused of fraudulently paying for nearly $100,000 worth of private gourmet meals at the taxpayer's expense and covering it up by creating a false impression that the Prime Minister's home did not have a personal chef. Police and state officials made their indictments based on the testimony from Nir Hefetz, a former aide and personal friend to the Netanyahu family. Hefetz is also providing key testimony in a number of graft investigations surrounding Prime Minister Netanyahu himself. Police have already recommended criminal charges in two of those scandals, with one case still being investigated and another in which Netanyahu is not at this time a prime suspect. Sarah Netanyahu's lawyers have challenged that their client is not a public servant and therefore is ineligible to commit fraud of this kind to begin with. That's a position that they may now need to be defending in court in the near future. Officials have just revealed some shocking news. The personal information of thousands of former IDF soldiers has been hacked, stolen, and sold to third parties over the course of the last several years. Now, this is one of the biggest breaches to take place inside of the army in quite some time. Four Israeli suspects, including two IDF soldiers, are now believed to be behind this massive string of crimes. This has apparently all been going on since at least 2011. Back then, four suspects, including two civilian contractors in the Army's Meitav unit and two IDF soldiers with high-level security access to the IDF's recruitment system, allegedly started a scam to hack the personal detail of thousands of former soldiers. Army databases kept this info on hold, including where the former soldiers currently live, their phone numbers, if they have children, and much, much more. The suspects are believed to have stolen this intel and sold it to third-party clients, most likely marketing collectors. And that's why between 2011 and 2014, former 
armor soldiers began reporting a suspiciously high level of targeted cyber marketing. The Justice Department eventually found cause to open a full investigation into this, and many years later, Israel's Privacy Protection Authority believes that this was, in fact, one of the biggest cyber scams to happen within the confines of the army in quite a while. Officials are urging the Justice Department for criminal indictments on all four suspects, including violating privacy, conspiracy, bribery, hacking, and illegally distributing privileged documents. While it does not immediately seem as though this intel was directly sold to any foreign entities, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. One needs to look no further than the recent Cambridge Analytica scandal in the US as reference. Now in that case, personal data from Facebook was allegedly taken without users' permissions and filtered to outside clients for the purposes of potentially swaying the 2016 US presidential election. If cyber terrorists were able to glean this kind of personal detail from thousands of IDF soldiers from a third-party marketing share, this would truly be a security nightmare. Following years of delays, red tape, and fierce debate, the Jerusalem municipality has confirmed that the egalitarian prayer space at the Western Wall is all set for construction. This is a space intended to allow mixed prayer of all kind at the Holy Kotel. Despite the religious debate that has often hampered this kind of effort, work will commence almost immediately in order to accommodate infrastructure for people in wheelchairs. This project has been in limbo for many years now, following intense ultra-Orthodox protests that prayer at Judaism's most holy site should comply with Talmudic laws separating men and women. But for many worshippers and foreign travelers, the religious freedom to practice their Judaism as they see fit has led to repeated calls for an egalitarian section at the Kotel. Earlier this year, it seemed that things were finally moving when Culture Minister Miri Regev was tasked with handling the plans herself. But shortly thereafter, Regev dropped out due to what she called personal conflicts of interest. The committee tasked with construction failed to find a willing replacement for Regev for a number of months. Word is that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself stepped in to give it the green light, and this seemingly does appear to be the case now. Jewish rabbis both abroad and here in Israel have hailed this news as a major step forward for religious freedom, one that should allow all Jews the chance to express their religion in whatever form they choose without stepping on anyone else's. That's all for now. Follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at Al TV News. I'm Brett Allen Smith, and see you later with our main daily broadcast from Israel at 2 p.m. Eastern Time.